today, guys, I have my friend Ted Forbes. We go back. Yes, we do. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. Oh yeah. Um, but his YouTube channel is The Art of Photography. It has five hundred forty thousand subscribers and forty million views across your channel. Did you know that? That's pretty no, impressive. I didn't know that actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I, I looked you up. I made sure I. I <laughs> I made sure I knew what you were doing recently, you know? I appreciate that, Because the first thing I want to talk about is pretty funny because okay. my, I don't know if you remember this, but my entire branding kind of started out with your video, like the collab that we did. Are you sure about that? Because I, I know what you're talking about, the mm. rhymes with Peachy. Yeah. So I would always say, sounds like Peachy. Sounds like Peachy. Oh, and I said But the rhymes. title of your video was Rhymes with Peachy. Right. And I remember looking at that and being like, that's it. That's my branding. Sarah Dietschy rhymes with Peachy. And that was back in the day when I was at 3,000 subscribers, Do I, I think. Do invoice you directly for that? Or is I mean, <laughs> sure. Now, uh, where I got it, though, was I, I swore that on your bio on your YouTube channel, you said rhymes with Peachy. I don't think I no, did. No, what did you say then? Because maybe sounds I like peachy. Sounds like peachy. I think I, I yeah. Said rhymes with peachy. Yeah. Okay, all right. And I remember that being such a smooth, uh, smooth. Uh, you know, what slogan, or just a very catchy. It was just, just more catchy. Sarah Dietschy rhymes yeah. peachy, and it all started with you, Ted. Well, thank you. I. I Let's give I it had, up for I Ted had, Forbes, guys. I had no idea that I was that saying. Because <laughs> that was okay. Let's think back. That was in 2015. It was it probably so. It's twenty. Uh, yeah, it was in twenty fifteen because I, I had not moved to Fort Worth yet. So I'm trying to remember, and I, I, I researched this <laughs> yeah. research by trying to remember um, the extensive research. I was trying to remember how we met, and I don't remember how I came across your channel, but I do remember reaching out to you because, however, I came across your channel. You used to do this thing on your channel. You did your creative stuff with where you do interviews with Creative the, Spaces creative TV. Spaces TV. You had the the uh, photographer that was the first one I saw in Tennessee, yeah. um, and then you also used to do these kind of I wouldn't call them vlogs because it was kind of pre vlogging, okay. but you did a lot of rooftop view footage. Rooftop vibes. I rooftop had, vibes. I had a I had a friend cool. in Dallas who just knew all the best rooftops, and so we would just go to them and make YouTube videos. You had about better it. connections than I did. <laughs> Um, and no, because I remember you emailing me and basically yeah. being like, you were on top of my building. Yeah, that was the building I live in. I'm like, there, that's got to be, it's the same view. And then like, I could see the bench or something. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's, I've got to reach so out. Funny. And then it turns out we had our mutual friend, Rob, who yeah. lived in Rod. Rob's a hilarious. Shout dude. out to Rob. Oh, shout out to Rob. <laughs> he was like the, yeah, he was so he, quirky and oh, he's such a good video guy. He's yeah. awesome. And, uh, and such a laid back dude. And I'm yeah. like, you know, Sarah, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah but yes yeah, so i reached out and and then we kind of met through that and then i featured you on my channel because i was doing this thing where i was featuring other youtube channels because i was like this girl's good she's like especially creative spaces tv was like i swear to this day i told you at lunch that that like still is dynamite um very underrated youtube content thank you and you it were does sitting terrible like, on the platform but i know but you were sitting at three thousand subs and yeah. i'm like this person like i mean god you've got to like get eyeballs on this yeah. work so and, and that's why to the this day you know I was saying earlier I think in the beginning when people are just discovering you they they need something to really be like wow they stand out they're doing yeah. something different so in the beginning it's not about quantity it is a 100% about quality because you have to make a name for you yourself this is the opportunity when you can make the stuff that you're proud of you can take a month to make a video because there really is no rush you I think no pressure once you have the audience that's when you really got it that's when consistency matters right yeah. you got to keep them there yeah, see the pressure goes um, up and, yeah and and yeah, we did a creative spaces on you. That was exciting. You did. And and that's when it was so cool because the timing of everything, when you reached out to me, I was still like super hustling, three thousand, four thousand subscribers. You were still so, in, in college at the time too. Yeah, yeah. So when yeah. I had a YouTuber, I think at the time like you had a hundred K or something subs yeah. and I, I knew of you. I was like, Oh my gosh, Ted <laughs> Forbes is reaching out. This is sick. And I'm like, I can't believe I was on top of his apartment. <laughs> um, so that was sick and I was like instantly creative spaces tv was a way to really also build those relationships with people yeah. so i was like oh you're cool let's do a creative space tv and then we collabed 
And well, the yeah. funny thing was when you reached out to me, that's how I remember it was 2015 because that's when we were moving to Fort Worth. And I'm going from like the most awesome loft space. Which, so cool. Oh, I would, I mean, I cry to this day that I'm not there. I mean, it's like it was noisy at the time. This this is funny because like just it, technology wise, things have changed. Like most cameras didn't have automatic ISO. So like you'd be in the amazing light with those windows and clouds would cover and your exposure would change. And I constantly just be going crazy getting up and like stopping and trying to refilm and I try to do everything. I didn't take. think about that. Yeah. Auto ISO being something like it, a feature. It, like the next, yeah, the next year cameras started feature or Sony's did. I, maybe wow. somebody had it, but the stuff I had didn't. Which, and, and that's why people are always like, oh, you don't have a lot of natural light in your office. And like, I got enough natural lighting at home when it comes to shooting. Yeah. You just need studio lights because oh, it is kind is of a pain. Perfect, yeah. yeah, it's kind of a pain. Because you're diffuse um, enough. And you yeah, yeah. Key, but, but that loft was amazing the loft was amazing and so sarah reaches out to me and and we had i was in the process of moving to to fort worth at the time into a house and i was a little uh, nervous about this because it's the not burbs. It, yeah it's burby it is not cool it's not not hip and so uh she's like do you want to be on creative spaces tv and i'm like i'm completely flattered that you asked i'm like I got to look creative in three months because I think we we're going to do it over your winter break. And so it was right around Christmas. It was either before or after. It's when I lived in Tennessee, guys. Yeah. So she was home for the break because we, I don't know if we mentioned, but we both grew up in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Dallas Fort Worth. Oh, yeah. I don't even so think I mentioned that. Yeah. I'm from Dallas originally, born and raised 20 years. You still live in the Same Dallas here. Fort Worth area. So, yeah. yeah born and cool. raised yeah. more than 20 years. Um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that was the deal. So I remember like Christmas rolls around. I got moved in and I had, so this house has four bedrooms and the fourth bedroom used to be a garage. It was added on. And I thought I've got like no time to get this looking cool. My white cat is with me. Um, <laughs> she missed you. Uh, she I got in your kitties. bag when I'm we did so that video. I'm so sad. I don't have any cats. Anyways, continue. Well, anyway, so we, uh, I, I, I painted just for that video. I got my walls painted and like it. literally and it looked great. Yeah. I was done the night before. Like really, I mean, you get stunk in there. We we're all getting high from like, <laughs> paint I didn't even know that. <laughs> no, it was awesome. That's it was, amazing. Uh, it was Just fun. And I don't know that it was your greatest video because I look at it very differently because I'm in it and I can't stand it. But, but it was, it was an honor to be part of that process. Yeah. It was, and, and it was a lot of fun. And, yeah. and so I think it's cool to sit down with you now. Uh, cause you were kind of one of my OG collabs, OG yeah. YouTube collabs. And obviously well, we both are way into that whole creative direction thing. Yeah. So in creative we get together, process, it's like, exactly. And shitty, you know, yeah, not only shitty. do we love gear and we both talk about gear, but why I love your stuff too, is you do a really good job of documenting photographers and documenting Thank their you. process. So, um, obviously I have so many questions. I'm so excited for you to be here, but I want to <laughs> start out talking about what we actually just talked about a little bit okay. you are actually editing a lot of your youtube videos on your ipad i am oh my gosh so Crazy, i moved over there's this there's this app called luma fusion, luma fusion that yeah. is the new bee's knees people are talking about it and it, ba it basically enables you to take this a12 crazy chip in the ipad and your phone yeah. and edit in ways that you could only previously edit on your desktop yeah. so Actually, tell me a little bit about it and kind of like how it fits in your workflow. Yeah, so uh, like I'm sure you did too. I mean, I've had iPhones since the 3G or whatever. Um, it, I've had iPads since the first one. And I've always liked the idea of being able to work mobile. And I always thought that there were some interesting things that were put into the phone or the iPad. That, but, you know... It, when it came down to a real project with a real timeline and a deadline and you know it just wasn't there you know I could you couldn't do it and so it was it was around when they when they made the announcement for the a12 chip because they were talking about the latest phone and I, I I upgraded from like a 6s to this so I mean it was like so you your mind was blown. Like, blah, yeah. yeah I mean yeah. this is like uh, in the old one just shattered and and I was like you know what and it was it wasn't that I was like broke or avoiding the technology it was just the pain a lot of, of times having to move. you just yeah. don't want to move it and it just never was worth it for me so anyway so yeah it this was well worth it but I remember in that keynote and yeah I have this joke on my channel about the deeper pixels because they use that which is a thing but not really for a camera phone but anyway um so I it was like okay jokes aside um you know they were saying that that actually is better calculations per second whatever it, you have more power coming off that chip than you do out of your iMac and so I thought this was around Christmas and that's really the only downtime I get all year and so that's usually when I try to rebuild an OS or, you know, it's something that's going to be time consuming. And so I thought about this year and I, my iMac's getting old, my laptop's getting old. And I'm like, I don't want to buy a new computer right now, but I just don't feel safe. moving forward. I'm like, wait a minute, what if I tried to use an iPad? And so I looked online, actually it was Jonathan Morrison's videos that we were talking about. I found his and then also Henny the Business. Do you know Henny? 
he does music and Henny's well because I think Jonathan and him did a collab they did. They collabed. and that That's video was so good That's how I found out about Henny and Henny is a, a music producer from Atlanta uh, sweet guy I reached out to him and he was just totally cool um he has moved most of his production workflow to the iPad. And so his videos actually helped me more even than Jonathan's. And so I thought, I'm going to give it a whirl. And I was looking at LumaFusion that they're all talking about. And, and the biggest trick right now is getting your files to, in the phone, by the way, and I was showing Sarah this earlier. The only problem with the phone is the screen's so small, but like it's actually just as fast. I mean, and it's faster than my desktop editing Final Cut and the fans all blow up like it's about to like take flight or something, you know? And um, yeah, I've, I, it's... And the, the biggest cool. thing with this, because I think a lot of people who start, they get intimidated by the prices of everything. So yes. first you have Final Cut, which isn't as bad as Adobe, but that initial cost of 225 250 whatever 300 it is, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and then you have Adobe stuff where you're paying $50, $70 a month. Yep. That's crazy to yeah. some people. I think in the professional sense, you just take that off of your first job and boom, it's worth it. And right? it's tax deductible if you're making a living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but for the people who start, I think it is pretty difficult to find affordable software out there and affordable hardware that can take it. So I always um, suggest DaVinci Resolve because it yeah, is free, free up until 4K mm -hmm. and you're not going to be messing around with 4K. You can do um, some 4K stuff for free. Can you? Yeah, the limitations, yeah, anyway, there are some Maybe you can't color grade or something. Yeah, I don't there's know. Some, there's, it's an output yeah. thing, yeah. Um, but what's so crazy about this LumaFusion mm -hmm. is it's $20. $20 app. It's, and it's, you buy it and you're done, mm -hmm. right? And then you can buy an iPad Pro. I mean, they, they could do a LumaFusion 2 probably. Right, some people right, do that, right. But yeah. Um, and then iPad Pro mm -hmm. starts at $750. So That'll we're, work. we're all of a sudden seeing these barriers for entry. They just keep shrinking, yeah, right? They are. And so in terms of usability, and then we'll move on, but I'm just so inter know, interested interested in this. Yeah. It is, it is. But hey, we're geeks here at the That Creative Life <laughs> podcast, okay? Um, do they limit the amount of maybe color grading layers or video yeah. tracks? You're going to run into some limitations. And the reasons why, I don't think they're holding anything back. It's just, it's a new app. It's only a few years old. And so those things, like they're constantly updating it and, and they're going to get there with it. Um, the, the short backstory there is um, people are probably not familiar with Avid. Avid is software that's like, it's been around longer than Final Cut. Final Cut and Premiere are basically like, emulating what Avid was doing early on. But back in the old days before a computer could handle even HD video, right? Um, oh, Avid, I remember the time in Final Cut 7. Yes. Where, guys... Around if, then, yep. Oh my gosh. If you are new and you're just getting into it and you're complaining about speeds, there was God. a time where in Final Cut 7, the, the pro software that everyone used, if you made one change to a video, if you added a filter, if you made a cut, mm -hmm. you would have to set your in and out points and render it before you could watch it back. So yep. there was no live playback, which yeah, seems live crazy. Yeah, had to render, yeah. It seems crazy now. It had like to build some proxy that you could actually exactly. watch on the computer. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually, this was, that was one of the first ones that you could actually function on a computer. Like the Avid used to make these systems that they would use for tele, they still do, for television shows and movies. And it was external hardware. And they were, they cost a fortune. I had a friend who had a video studio. We're still friends, but he, uh, um, he had the Avid Symphony when it came out, and that was, oh God, that was like a $20,000 system. And so your computer would just kind of drive it, but it did all the file handling and the, and so anyway, so Avid, so this is some ex-employees from Avid, and they're still around, and they also make uh, Pro Tools, for those of you who do audio production, that's an Avid, yeah. Avid product too. Which Pro Tools is huge, industry yeah, standard. Yeah, huge, big music projects. Which you, you did music too mm -hmm. right so yeah. we kind of have that overlap yes, too because I, yeah. I remember when i came to your office um we were talking about like using loops and producing our yep. own music and stuff you were which, trying to get me to play guitar too and i didn't have any yeah. of my stuff set up and i really so next time you come by it's all set up have a jam session. oh we will have a jam yeah. session. i bought all of my old guitar equipment back so i have i have yeah um i have it over there I'll you sold it all to buy after. black magic cinema cameras i've I sold it all to to buy all of my video cam uh, equipment yeah, yeah. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. So, so next time you come, be ready because I'm I'm so prepared. I want to yeah. be in a band again. I know. Wouldn't that be I fun? Do. It would I do. So I need fun. like four more hours of the day to make any of this <laughs> I know. happen. But I know. You know. I know. One day. I, that's why I bought my stuff back. I was like, I need a hobby with no pressure to earn money off of it because yeah. the moment video became my job, you know, it loses a little bit of the shininess. It, it does two things. It loses, sorry, this is probably not where you were going with this conversation, but it's worth saying that, that a lot of people don't understand that. And, and part of our job is it, we do have to come off 
having fun and, 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 and it is a lot of it is, is a lot of fun and largely, I think, I think the problem is, is that it takes so much time. You'll get to 11 at night and you're just exhausted and, and you then never you wake prepared. up and, and start you, over again. again. <laughs> yeah. You're ready to wash, rinse and repeat. And, and there are times like this month has been like that for me up until this trip, which is kind of nice to have a day to come up here and do this. Uh, but this month I had some sponsor placements I had to do. I, there was some stuff I had to cover. There's some stuff I wanted to cover. And I kind of overbooked the month. And two weeks ago, I'm like sitting there, what have I done? I mean, it's just, it's crazy some days. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, and it's still fun. I don't want to say it's not, but but you mentioned music as a hobby, and it's really important to try to carve time to do something. I mean, I'm bad about it, and I'm glad that you're doing that, because now you're going to make me do it too. So yes. that's, yeah. I love it. Because you got to have, even if it's just 10 minutes a day, and, and you're not any good at it or mm -hmm. whatever, it's like, it's something to just get your mind off yeah. of. Yeah. And uh of some like a quote that John tweeted today that I thought was really good. I don't know who it's by, so I'm going to butcher it, but it's basically have three hobbies. One that makes you money. One that is like keeps you fit. And then one that keeps you creating, keeps you creative. Okay. And I think like that's a good balance, right? Yeah. That's that's a really good balance. Yeah. Um, physical stuff is important too. Yeah. You know, you've got to, John like, has it built in. I know. I'm so jealous. I know, right? I'm like, I got to go hit the basketball court again. Um, but time in the day. <laughs> come on. Yeah. Um, but okay, let's talk photography. Okay. Obviously, right? Get back on track. We're going to talk so much photography. But um, everyone, like nowadays, right, they can take a decent photo with their phone. So it's very different from back in the day of when people were uh, precious with their pictures, right? It costs money. Film photography costs money. Um, and I, I find myself just firing off pictures on my iPhone. Sure. You know, it's like, hey, get a picture of us. And then it's like... Da -da 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 -da. You don't even think about the story. And right? then, exactly. And then you don't go back and look at it because there's not just that one good picture, right? Um, so, like, what do you, <laughs> comments on that, but also how do you think people can be more intentional with photography and the age of digital photography? That's a good question. I think, one, you said it best. It's like, I, photography has become much more, I would say it's democratized now than it used to be. It used to be that you had to get a camera, um, you had to pay for film and processing and printing and all that, um, or do it yourself or whatever. But it was it was because there was such a steep learning curve to it uh, that it was it was restricted to people who were really interested in it. Now it's totally different. And what changed all that? And you know all the DSLR companies and, and mirrorless and all this stuff. They, that that's part of their problem now is that, that everyone has a camera on their phone. And for the family pictures of the soccer mom or whatever, that probably is good enough. In fact, it's more than good enough, and that's what they should be using. Plus, it has all the built-in sharing capabilities. So not, you know, people now who are growing up don't understand that, like, they're too close to the force of the truth. They have this amazing power, this this thing that fits in their pocket that they're able to, sorry, my phone's over, that's why I'm indicating it, but <laughs> offset. Uh, but uh, it's this amazing thing that can capture pretty good pictures, even in low light now. Even These optics are still kind of the challenge, but they're doing great stuff with that. You can immediately put it on the internet and reach however many people you can possibly I mean that's a whole nother game but but it's the you could text it to your friends or your family I mean you have that communication aspect of it I think also um and, and this affects me as well is that the photography now has utilitarian um uses too like for instance uh I need to remember which medication I needed to buy or what kind of creamer or <laughs> so I'll take a bit because I you know and then I go to the grocery store I remember stupid stuff like that uh where my parking meter was, you know, things like that. So it's got that to it too. And people use it for that all the time. Like even just saving ideas for design stuff. Or, and so it, it, it's very much different now, but I, I think you kind of answered it with the question is, is how can you be more deliberate? I think it, it's, it's a matter of just finding that inspiration of what it is that you want to do. I mean, somebody who's going to use their phone for utilitarian purposes is going to use it for that. They don't really have an ambition beyond that. And that's fine. Um, but, I think the bigger problem is there's a lot of people who are creative minded that feel like it's hard to stand out because it's so competitive or there's so much competition. And, and I think you have to kind of embrace the technology and the time and the, the world we live in today. Like I'm doing the street photography workshop and, and it's one thing to go show all these amazing vintage photos in New York City. But I have to remind people this is not the same New York City that you're going to go photograph. It's not the same people. It's not the same time. It's not the same economy. It's not the same cameras. It's not the same technology. The city's the same, and I guess there's an element that permeates with people through that, but but it's it's your world now. 
And you just have to figure out how to be inspired and stay on. I mean, I think it, most people know you and your show, obviously, and they know that's something you're very dedicated to, which is probably why we, we got along really well early on, too, because we're both real passionate about that. Um, and it takes a certain weird type of person to say, you know, and I'm going to ditch everything and really pursue this um, to a large degree. Um, and you're kind of stepping out. It's the Indiana Jones scene, you know, or it's the faith element comes in. And, but, you know, yeah, you have to be more deliberate. I mean, the tools are there. I think that's the biggest problem we have now is that the technology, the learning curve is so reduced. Mm -hmm. um, you can put it into auto mode and get really good quality stuff on anything. Do you think yeah. that now everyone uses their iPhone and there might not be that extra push to learn how to use a decent camera? Do you think the kids today are going to have as good pictures as maybe my parents have. Do you think they'll have more? Do you think the quality, cause maybe I had this crazy anomaly of a family, but my granddad shot, um, film like his entire life, uh, with his Leica camera. So, so he was into he, it. If he had a Leica though. He yeah, was, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the pictures that he took in the sixties and seventies, I swear look like they were taken yesterday. Yeah. And they are so beautiful and so tasteful. And then you look at like an iPhone picture that was shot in like crazy harsh lighting of like a kid's birthday. And it might not be the best, but then you have like 40 different versions of that. So <laughs> you're probably not going to add it in a scrapbook. People Spray probably don't pray. even. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One and will then, be good. <laughs> and then people probably don't even. Um, Cause you know, like scrapbooking, making picture books, I guess maybe Instagram, would you say Instagram is the modern day oh, yeah, scrapbook, sure, you know, sure. cause for a lot of people it is. Yeah. Cause I think what I'm experiencing in my life is I don't have a very good curated like memory book with it, or photo book yeah, of just sure, like sure. personal moments, of, right, you know, right. cause on my Instagram and I guess this is a, a unique because it's my job. Um, maybe Instagram doesn't purely reflect how my photo book would look. Oh, so that's no, something no. that's something that I'm thinking about recently is like maybe I need to be a better curator of yeah. my photos. I think it's you know? curator and I think it's also uh, it's the intention. And, and I think one of the things that the, you mentioned something to the effect of if the, if the phone's easy to do and, and the Leica was more deliberate. And, and that does that ease of use and that low learning curve does invite, um, <laughs> I think, in many ways, uh, I'm trying to think of how to say this, but but like the ability to not really give a crap, you know, it's like it's like because it's so easy to do. Like you said, that your grandfather's photos, the beautiful lighting, and then just these gorgeous pictures. There was just so I had like a aha moment because I don't want to seem like a asshole snob person. That's like oh like a you know like whatever you <laughs> no, don't no, you no, don't no, need no, a like no. a. But I had this aha moment when I finally got into film photography and I sh started shooting with a super or a 35 millimeter, and. I always thought people who still shot film were just snobs. I'm like, just hipsters. Yeah. yeah, just hipster snobs. I'm like, you guys are ridiculous. But then I went around with my Canon A1, which is not a, it's like a $150 camera. Mm -hmm. And because I knew I only had 36 exposures, I was so intentional with every picture. Yep. And every single picture I got back from that California vacation was so good and oh, like yeah. memories that I will hold on forever. So, I guess it's kind of, I think the, the good middle ground is maybe having, bringing in that intentionality with the, the digital products that we use today. Yeah, it's, it's the tool and, and your approach. And, and sometimes those tools, because of the ease of use, I think they, they inspire a lazy approach um, right. to where you're just going to shoot the birthday party at fire. Because the truth is you can get really nice photos on an iPhone, but sometimes you have to think, okay, I need to bring the exposure down a little because I want this moody thing. We need to light it. And you, you, you could do that. But the, oh, it's iPhone. I don't do that. It's just going to look fine. And so it, it does come down to that intention of what it is that you're trying to get across on there. And yeah, those limitations can increase that. Because yeah, 36, I've got, I've got two rolls of film with me. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so I just really only going to click that shutter when, when my jaw drops. You know what I mean? Right. It's like when it's right. Um, I'm not just going to go 
spray and pray, as yeah. I said earlier. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause, yeah no, cause I think that's, there's, that's there's good, though. There's good and bad to both, and I think in the middle ground is, and I think I just need to start deleting pictures, honestly. Well, it's, it is I, curating, I like and, and you'd be surprised, because like, I feel the same way you did about like family photos mm-hmm. and the scrapbook and stuff, because we had a sea of them. Um, and just years of growing up and, and yeah. back then they're all filming. We have boxes of the stuff. And, and one thing that my mom did that was kind of cool is, um, oh, this has been a while, but probably about five or six years ago, um, she decided she needed to get rid of all this. And it's the same approach. She was like, there's just too much junk in here. The stuff that doesn't matter. So what are those ones? And she actually spent an enormous amount of time and she made, um, two scrapbooks that, you know, she put the photos and stuff. She gave one to my sister and one to me of her curated moments and so she could like get some rid of some of the other stuff and it's cool because it's this great book i keep it in the closet i look at it now and then and i don't need to remember everything and it's it's it but it's the the moments at camp or graduation or this school play or whatever it was that means something to you so those moments might be there and yeah curating so to speak and weeding through there does do a lot of that and and yes i think it's different for us because we heavily curate our instagram it, we have to because we do it I'm for thinking, a job. I feel like I need to just take a week off and just make uh, – because there's a lot of good companies out there. I think like uh, Artifact Uprising or Rising or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that make really cool bound digital photo yes. books. So I feel like I just need to take a week and yeah, just like – just you know all that free time you got all that free time i got oh my gosh <laughs> one day but one, one day, day guys one day. i'll do it yeah um but you you study a lot of photographers and i love I, we were just talking about this with the videos that take the most time yeah are usually not the one that uh youtube rewards you because no. with views it's just so a lot of these videos it's, that we do that frustrating are more quality that might creatively fulfill us you know it's not as uh, it doesn't get as many views but some of those videos are some of my favorite of yours and so well, you've you. You've, likewise i mean that's how this you. conversation started earlier. exactly yeah. exactly and, and I, I, I i told you i said when i released those how depressed i was that, that people weren't watching them and you were like well, why do you don't why do you think i don't do those anymore? but you know the other funny thing too because i believe me i had this mental breakdown when i released those and i've never i mentioned it on my show recently but um you know i i did a crowdfunding thing and i decided I wanted to do a series with the best photographers that are alive today that I could possibly find. I'm not in them. They're like your creative spaces, TV stuff. Um, and that's how I rolled with it. And, and when I came back and launched those, I was just, it was weird because the comments, there was no trolling. They were all glowing. It rhymed. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It was like, it was a really nice small reception, but I can't do that for a living because it's like, they just, it's not sustainable. Uh, but the weird thing is, is over time they continue to get views. But I think the other problem is, is that, because they were special, people were like, oh, they're, you know, when you're watching YouTube, I'm at home, at the bus stop, or I'm at work, or I'm commuting, I'm going to save this for later. And they don't come back to it. You know, so there was a lot of that. Um, and it, you think about it, you t- I had a friend that said, you know, you, you think of it as like you're putting a five-star restaurant into a strip mall with a bunch of fast food. Because that's... You have the destination. Which which which, which sucks. Context. Because Sarah, I think, I, I always argue that it's... I got frustrated because of the reaction, but it's important for us to do those projects somehow. And so I'm like, what I'm thinking now is like, I I mean, I'm going to do season three of this, but then I can't do much more. So if I am going to do it, like how could, is there another platform, another way I could do it to keep it special? Because your soul depends on that kind of work. You making stuff that you're proud of, right? Work that matters, right? Exactly. And I can definitely put together a camera or phone review that I'm proud of, but it might not necessarily be that fulfilling. Right. And, and, and what are you going to look back in 10 years and think it's, it's exactly. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of, I talk about this all the time on this podcast is the evergreen content versus the topical content. So if we just made camera review videos, there would really not be much for a new person to go back and look like on our True. channel. But if you have a new viewer, they check out your playlist, check out your channel. You know, there's that content there that's like, wow, it's evergreen. It's people mm-hmm. can go back to it, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it is important to have a mix of most, uh, both, but also uh, reminding once it is your job, this is something that I had to deal with recently. When I started this podcast, it was super fun like super fun because I love interviewing people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is super fun right now. This is super fun, right? I'm having a good time. Yeah. (laughs) But then there came a moment where I was like, I kind of got spooked because I wasn't making money off of it. And this is my job now, right? So I was like, oh, wait, what am I doing dedicating this time to this? But I had to kind of take a step back and be like, 
Sarah, you did YouTube in the beginning for five years without making money off of it, you know? And this is something that is putting me in rooms with not just catching up with friends, but also like interviewing, you know, people like Gary Vaynerchuk, who I wouldn't be in a room with unless I had that podcast going. So I think there's, there's stuff that it might not pay off monetarily, but the relationships you build and just creatively, I love this. I love it, talking it's different. to people. Yeah, you it, know? it's hard because you can't define it in the same level of success. And, and that's a hard thing, I think, for any creative is how do you define that success because I still have trouble with that. And I keep thinking as I get older, maybe I won't at some point, but I, I, it doesn't happen. But yeah, you have to remind yourself that it's okay, have fun. Because like how many times would it be cool to like go back to the very beginning to where you're not, you have other ways that you're paying the bills. And um, you don't have that pressure. There's no brand deals that, that are contingent on it needs to be successful or whatever. And you're just making stuff you want to make, you know? I mean, that was, it, there are times where it's like, I really miss that, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> you know. I mean, trust me, I, I do have to pinch myself a lot because when I think about what my job is, wow, crazy, cool, amazing. Sure. But there there are moments in the beginning also where I don't know how to describe it, but it's just, it's something that I haven't felt in a while, which is kind of like sad admitting, but it's just sheer, I will do anything and everything to get to this point, And it does not matter what gets in my way. Like yeah. in the beginning, it was the such, hunger. oh my God, the hunger was, I, I can't explain to people what it was. And with the, the viral Casey video, I can't tell you like how many videos there were before that, that I thought was going to be the viral video, you know? Right. And it's weird now to like have the dream job and then not have the same hunger, which I, I mean, it's just kind of a statement that I'm putting out there, but it changes, right? It changes. Yeah. And I don't think it, 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 yeah. And I'm, I'm very careful because I don't, because you don't want to seem like a person who's complaining about their job, who has the best job ever because it is great, but there's certain aspects to it. That are different. Yes. And, and well, and I say that because I remember there was a day where I had a day job and podcasting was on its kind of first wave back then. And I had a couple of podcasts I listened to religiously. And, and there was a point where that job was, was a, a pretty serious beat down and I was really kind of not very happy in, in life. And like the, my biggest part of my day was, was I would get out of there and I'd go over to Plaza of the Americas for lunch you know, where they had yeah. the food court and the, in the skating rink, which is totally corny. But, but I would go sit there and I'd wear my headphones and have my iPhone and, and I'd, I'd grab lunch and I'd listen to pie and cause I would escape work and all that stuff. And I, this is what I wanted to do back then. And I, and I, I hadn't, I guess I had started my channel, but it was real limited. It was early, early on. Um, you, you worked at a museum though. Yeah. Which I worked was at it. Well, cool. and that's where I worked. Yeah. It yeah. was cool. And it should have been incredible I, I don't know I, I don't, but it's, it's still a nine to five you're answering to someone else and that's it, it's it's a non-profit and yeah. it's political I mean yeah. there, there were there were there was a time in there where it was really um challenging for yeah. me um so if I heard me now saying these things you would be like, slap them in the face yeah, come exactly on, don't be asshole Ted this is like you know yes. this is where I want to be and so yeah. I have to remember that guy too you know and and uh and yeah and I have to remember though it's sometimes when I'm having a really bad day you'll love this so a friend of mine told me this he said just remember the worst day you're having at this job is still better than the best day you had. Mm, that's good. And I like that. That's and I good. wouldn't trade it for anything. And I would equate that to the worst day I'm having being as a YouTuber is nowhere close as to being a college student because oh, absolutely. I, Oh my gosh, that was so bad. It was an environment you I hated not my into. life I remember. <laughs> so bad. It was awful. So, so yes, but then, you know, we, you, you can still talk about your ups Here's and downs. a funny conversation though. Cause we, we were sitting in my kitchen and we, I think we had finished filming and we were hanging out cause you had, uh, I can't remember your friends now. You had two friends with you. Uh, Chelsea, I Chelsea think, and, there? uh, someone, oh, I don't remember. Oh, I'll think of it. Anyway. So we're sitting there talking and, and you and I were talking cause we, we, that was the first time we'd met. We'd only been emailing before that. And, um, you were, I, I, I thought you were thinking about dropping out of school and so I thought, and I didn't know you had already. And so, so I'm like trying to offer you some advice. Oh, just hang in there. You'll be glad you did. And you're like, well, I kind of already dropped out. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my, once my mind was set on that, when I yeah. have an idea, there is no going back. I, no, no, I do remember because like you, you said, uh, you said, yeah, haven't had the dad talk yet. Oh, yeah. And, and you're like. You know, the boyfriend talk is way easier than the dad yeah, talk. And I was I like, mean, that's hilarious. Yeah, it's one of those things where it, it got to a point where if you're not paying for it, you have no 
say over my life because like I, I my, my parents weren't paying for college so um, my mom was super understanding and my dad obviously came around he's one of my biggest fans sure. but um, I think people have to remember that it's your life and even if your parents are paying for college have those conversations because I'm sure they would love to save some money too if you truly know what you want to do but college is a good place to explore and do you, do you feel like you had to convince your parents that you were because like I could tell when I first met you mm-hmm. that you were a very driven individual yeah and you have to be driven to do this exactly and my and that's why when the time came my mom understood because I was on the phone with her every day explaining to her what I was doing I was working um, after school I was working at a production company helping uh, with videos there so my mom always say says you know it's not like she was sitting on the couch eating cheetos she was out there doing things so if you that's what the difference is i say if you know what you want to do and you're determined um then that's when you drop out (laughs) if if you're if you have no idea and you're still searching maybe go to a community college a lot of times the the term dropout does indicate the guy sitting in his underwear eating cheetos right which i think is very different yeah Yeah, yeah. i think when people drop out it's because they find a purpose that doesn't require college and hopefully people can figure that out um that you don't need to pay so much money and you, you, you've got the rest of your life. That's the exactly. funny thing. I think college is you it, can always it's go forced back. on people really early. It's just a traditional model. Yeah. But it's like when you're 18, that's a time where I would even argue that maybe you want to explore a little bit totally. and figure yourself out. If you don't, if you're not driven, like I'm find out who s- yeah. you are. And I'm, I'm such a different person than who I was when I was 18. And sure. um, moving. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which but, is probably why your parents at that age are more, they're, yeah. they're protective of that because right. she's going to be a different person in a few years. She's young now. Right. right. So sometimes it's convincing and then showing that, that you know, right. that's what you're going to do. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so with all these, you know, videos that you made of other photographers who, mm-hmm. give me some names of some people and, and maybe one of your favorites that drop maybe, yeah, drop some names. Wow. Um, but also, you know, who impacted you the most? Who do you think had a powerful message to oh, share? Jeez. Um, you know, it, it, I, I will say this, and, and I'm glad you asked that question because it made me think of this. Um, when you're defining success, like we said, and, and if it's not in terms of views, likes, money, whatever that is. Um, the real reason I did this job or did this job, did this project is because this is something I, I've wanted to do it for a number of years and I'm just such a fan. And so really it's like, okay, Ted, just pick your favorites. I mean, and it was really hard because in the beginning you approach people and I had, I had no work to show them. And I had a couple of people say, well, can I see some of the videos you've done? No, I can describe what they'll be like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and By I, the second season is always easier to shoot yes, than the first season. Oh, it season. was way easier. Yes. Um, and, um, yeah, because, you know, it, these people are going to do it for free and they don't know you and they're wasting your time or you're, you wasting their time. Cause it's like, you know, we, we've said right now we've, we have a lot of invitations to, to just come do stuff and which are fun, but sometimes you have to say, well, okay, this is three days out of the office to go travel to do this, even though I pay me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Amy. Um, so anyway, so but so this is different because you're exchanging, you're giving. Well, them I'm not trying. A, I'm hoping, a video that's them. Yes, right? and I'm hoping. Yes, correct. And I'm and I'm. I don't want to be that burden to them because I know it's like. So uh, the first one I got was William Wegman, who's famous for shooting the dogs. Um, and the dogs were there. I mean, it's just it was amazing. Um, what does that mean? The dogs were there. Does he really photograph like his own? Like, so, does he have multiple dogs? Yeah, he's got two. Um, okay. So when 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 Bill started out. He was a conceptual photographer uh, in the 1960s, I guess. And so he would do these kind of, I'll send you some to use for B-roll if you want. But um, there's one of him that's like him with his mouth open, but it's a photo of a photo and it's being developed under the, pro- so it looks like the, he's drinking the camera, you know. So he did a lot of that stuff, which was very popular at the time. And then out of nowhere, he had this dog, Man Ray. He was a wine runner. Wine runner? Wine runner. How do you say that? Wine runner. Um, which are these amazing dogs. They don't shed. They're just beautiful personalities. They also don't live long. But um, anyway, that dog became famous. And he did, my favorite project of his was this series of conceptual videos. They, this was like, Instagram before Instagram. It's like they were all 20 seconds. And and he said at that time in the 70s, you had these people that were doing conceptual video art and it'd be like Bruce Nauman and stuff. And it was just weird. It was like, here's 20 minutes of a guy jumping rope in the corner. And we'll put it in an art museum and call it art. And it's displayed on antique TV. You know, and he'd want to do that. He just wanted to get in, get out. And he was influenced by comedians. And so he did. There's one called The Spelling Bee. And this dog's sitting up there going, and now you misspelled 
bear. You know, and it's really cute. It's super awesome. And so that was a fun one to do. And so Man Ray was his first dog who died. And then there was Fay Ray, who got very famous too. And then he worked for Sesame Street. And he did the, uh, oh, you probably remember him. early on, they were um, dogs doing letters and stuff. And wow. Yeah. And then he would dress them up as people. And it got really bizarre. And he made a ton of money. He owns a place in Chelsea, the whole building. Wow. Four stories. It's got a basement. He restores cars down there. He's got a video floor, a still floor, and the top has a ice rink and some offices. It's not an ice rink, it's, oh but he practices my. hockey up there. It's not ice, but oh yeah, it's it's gosh. insane. So, oh, and that's a uh, testament to niching down. A niching down. Yeah, Dogs. it is. <laughs> um, I will say, though, uh, of all the artist series people that, that, I mean, he was great, but I didn't have a real personal connection with Bill. There were a few people that I did. There's a Russian photographer, Alexei Titarenko. He and our friends will go to dinner when I'm in town. I need to call him, I forgot. Um, but I think he's great. Uh, he has a really interesting perspective because we're about the same age, but he grew up in Russia during the fall of the Soviet Union and our childhoods were completely different perceptions. And so it's really fun to talk to him. We did a YouTube stories project one time where they said, get somebody and have a conversation. I chose him. Uh, Keith Carter's another one that I, I really connected with. Um, uh, the, another really interesting one was Laura Wilson. Um, her, she's most famous cause her sons are Owen and Luke. You've got a connection with yeah. her, right? Uh, so she, <laughs> So random. Yeah. Um, she knows my grandparents. Yes. Because, so my dad and his brother and sisters um, grew up on the same street as the Wilsons. So my grandma and grandpa would hang out with the parents and my dad was good friends with, um, not Luke, who's the least famous one? The oldest one. I can't yeah. remember his name right now. Um, <laughs> the oldest out. Wilson. Yes. Uh, my dad's was, was friends with. Was and, Steven, then, but that's not right. and then oh. uh, my dad's younger sister was good friends with Luke. With Luke so okay. she would run around with Luke Wilson, but he said that Luke and uh, Karen were always the ones that everyone would pick on. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it, it's just, it's so funny that, yeah, they just grew up in Dallas over, together. Yeah. And over, then, and off a row lane yeah. over that area. And I'm pretty sure like, I'm, Oh, I don't want to, I hope my dad's not listening to this cause I don't want to mess this up, but I'm pretty sure the oldest Wilson, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your I name know, I'm cause you're not, out. you're not the super famous one. He was in my dad's wedding. I'm pretty sure. Oh, wow, so wow. they, they kept in touch until the twenties. So they were pretty close. Um, yeah. Did they go to school together? Was that the Yeah. The Jesuit. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I remember think, you told me yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so she's an amazing photographer, which I didn't know until I watched your video. She is. Uh, and, and it's kind of she's kind of a sleeper because like her sons are so famous and, and, but before they were famous, she, she assisted Richard Avedon on the American West project. And so that's what she was known for. And she does a lot of fine art work now. She does commercial work still. Um, she was the first person I interviewed and, 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 and I didn't, she's not, she, she was oddly personal. Uh, I don't hang out with her to this day, but, and, and, but I called her, she was like, had her assistant go through the emails that said, yes, be here at this time and all this. And I brought a friend and we go in there and she goes, we'll take over the house, just move furniture, whatever you want to do. And she was totally welcoming, did the interview. Um, and she made me retake a bunch of stuff cause she was warming up and it was fun. I was appreciated. Um, so we got to the end of the interview and she says, it's set up like this. And she says, can you turn the cameras off? I have an observation I want to make. I was like, sure. So I turned the cameras off. It was like, what's going on? And she said, I don't know what you said to me. She said, I turn these things down all the time. She said, but something about your email. I said, fine, do it. Uh, she said, now that I've seen you do your interview, you were prepared. You were, and she complimented me. And she said, I do these sometimes and people aren't. She said, you need to continue this project. You need to have the very best people you can possibly get. And she was very encouraging. And I really appreciated that. The other thing that was interesting is we had a conversation about similar to what you and I just had about this whole idea of being driven and decisive about things. And she said, the, the, I don't, my parents never would say this to me because it's not their experience. But she said in her experience, it was, it was, it's very motherly advice, but she said, you have to be um, single-minded. That's what she said, because there's so many people out there that, that don't want you to succeed and, and not in a vengeful way. Like they're not like coming out of the woodwork trying to get you, but it's like, it could be as simple as somebody who has parents that says, no, no, stick with this. And, and, you know, it's like, they don't know that they don't want you to succeed, but you have to like say, I'm going to do this. And she said, when uh, her son's they did their first movie, Bottle Rocket, with Wes Anderson. And Wes grew up in Dallas. Or no, they met him in college, but he would come over to the house. And so she knew Wes Anderson. And she did oh, the photography. I swear, if there was a moment where, like, my dad was in the vicinity of, like, a Wes Anderson, that's insane. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm sure he probably knew Wes. I mean, oh it was probably gosh. around that time. Um, because they did Bottle Rocket, and then there's two movies of Bottle Rocket that exist. There's a 20-minute black and white 16-millimeter demo that they did that they filmed behind the house in Greenway where I grew up, which is funny. Um, 
and then they got signed in Hollywood and did that. And so Laura said when they went to Hollywood uh, to go discuss that with the executive producers and they were going to do the movie, uh, she said the boys came back and she said, did you guys take notes? Did you do anything? And they said, this is all in my video. Uh, she said, they said, no. And she said, well, what? These people, he won six Oscars. We're like, why wouldn't you listen? They said, because mom, we, we know it. We've got it. We, we've did the, I mean, and she said she realized at that point that it really, yeah, it didn't matter that they'd signed these kids to do this movie and success or fail, it needed to be what they needed to do. So I like that. I mean, it was, it was just, I think that had a profound effect on me because later on she said, well, it's like exactly what you're doing. It's like, you know. Can you expand on that? So in terms yeah. of they, they as actors knew they were where they needed to be. and They knew that, what they wanted the script. Good. They knew what the final movie should look like. They knew what they were doing. They were confident about it. Right. They didn't need somebody's input on how the script should be written at that point. Now, you could interpret that one in two ways. Well, who are these young punks? At the time, they were not known. This was before all the big movies that they'd done. Um, and so, yeah, you could interpret that two different ways. But for Laura to at least recognize, even if they fail and they come off like two self-appointed jackasses, at least it was their project. And that's, you know, that that's... that. That's giving somebody a lot of room when, right. when, when you're going to give permission to do that. And sometimes that's giving ourselves permission to do that. Um, there's an enormous amount of risk in what we do and, and, and taking it. But, yeah, being single-minded and, and, and having a direction and believing in it, it's all really important. And that, that's, you know, I mean, it's not, I guess it's obvious advice, but just hearing that from somebody else no, I think good. was profound for me. And you know? being in the world we are now where you can really – learn how to do anything i think it's a superpower if you can hone in on one thing and be one of the best right i think that's a really good point because it's actually challenging now to do that i mean yeah. when you when you consider like you know the wilson boys growing up in life before the internet mm -hmm. and they're at ut spending their summer writing a script for this crazy movie with wes anderson who's a nobody at the time i mean it's like mm -hmm. that's what they did mm -hmm. and now we have so many distractions and so many things to keep us from from doing and gosh it's like sometimes i have to light a fire in my own butt to get up and do stuff because mm -hmm. it's like okay well it's kind of nice sitting here now because i'm tired or whatever and it's like yeah i could think about this another four hours and how great it would look if i took this camera and filmed it and like just get up and do right. it you yeah. know you yeah. just gotta go do it don't worry about what it's gonna you know just it's the it's the seeds the creative aspect of it that's 100%. the important part mm, you know that's good stuff yeah so you've gotten to talk with all these photographers so i know you probably hate this question but with all of the experience you have as your own <laughs> photographer and talking to other photographers what do you think essentially makes a good photographer oh, oh gosh uh for me it's something who has something to say um and and that sounds again very uh, institutional museum talk um but like when you look at the work of like I mean, I love history, so I love knowing what came before me, and 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 um, it has a vintageness to it that's always fun. But but it's like you know the photographers that I look into, um, and I think Laura and I agreed on this too. It's like one of the things. I mean, it's really easy for photographers now to trash the iPhone, for instance, or or whatever the latest technology or autofocus or whatever makes things easier. But the thing I is, I would is, never trash autofocus. No, what a I gem of a technology. Kind of kind of have to have that, but yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, but that's. Um, it, these tools enable us to do things that we weren't able to do before. And a lot of it is getting into the moment. Um, there was a photographer, Jacques-Henri Lartigue, who was this French photographer who uh, grew up in immense wealth and, and did all these early shots, but he was so radically different than everybody else because he would show action. He'd show the snapshot, the, um, the whole in the moment kind of thing. So, so it's like images like that, I think um, are something that drive me. They also tend to hold longer. Like I think what, what is not a good thing to get into for any photographer um, is is stylistic trends of the moment because those are things that will come and go uh, or something that's reliant on a technique or something like that. Like it, it, there were a lot of photographers before computers, before Photoshop that would get into these multi-layering things in the darkroom. Jerry Uselman was this name who was one of the big ones. And he did at the time like, mind-boggling people like how did he do that you know and then there was kind of a school of people who came along and those posters would sell at the mall you know you go to the gallery and it's the the guy looks like he's in the ocean but it's really a library underneath or, you know and they were multi-layered in the dark room and they were very difficult to make but now that photoshop has come along there's always a technology behind it that completely nullifies all that work because it's it, you don't recognize the challenge that it was to do that anymore because it's easy to do in photoshop so i think having staying power or providing images that are 
not only beautiful, but they're going to be considered to be that in the long run. I think it, was, it comes down to humanity sometimes, showing emotion, showing people, showing... Those are the kinds of things that I like, and that's what makes a good photographer. Um, and things that are timeless. I, I always look at because what why i like a lot of your um, videos especially when you dissect photographers is it, it's a wide range of people right and so we could be looking at pictures from the 1960s yeah. uh you know the i think it was a recent video you did um of the photographer who doc documented like rural south carolina um and the like childbirth yes uh, uh who is um, that? I uh, his name. w Jean smith yeah, yeah. And those pictures were so powerful. It was a photo essay and did for Life yeah, magazine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And to be able, it, it's almost like you just time travel to yeah, it is. to back there. And, and you realize that people are really not much, I and mean, their clothes are different. Yeah, <laughs> you know, their styles are different, but they're it still tells a story. Yeah. And, and by the way, that story was a, a um, it was a state run program uh, that was helping people in rural poor rural areas um, with this epidemic of of children dying in childbirth. And so this was about a nurse midwife who was on this crusade to try to have better success with it and help these people with, you know. Uh, and yeah, that was something that happened in the 1930s. But you're right, it, it could have happened yesterday. Or, or Who cares? I mean, it's, it's something we can identify story, with. telling that story, but right. also, and I think it's so fun to look at pictures I, uh, of you know, you could take a picture today and if it's a really good picture, it might just be something that's like, oh, that's cool. You forget about it. But then when you're looking back at it in 20 years and you see that car that looks so crazy in the back mm -hmm. of the picture and you see what the person's clothes was wearing and it's just a little time capsule where it's yeah, it's, it's even almost a, cooler you know 20 years from well, now. Well there's a period too because in, uh, so you take it now it's cool 10 years <laughs> 20 years oh vintage you know yeah, exactly. <laughs> the 10 year gap you gotta get past. Exactly <laughs> and when when you're saying uh, you know following trends and, and stylistic things I will always remember how many pictures are ruined from photographers editing the super heavy like hdr yes uh, right? styles of oh my god looking back it's hideous but yeah, why was awful. why was the hdr such a thing it was popular oh my gosh I mean, it just I hated makes it even pictures it was, look but, but, so whack oh yeah it's it's like bubblegum colors and yeah and basically if you it's a technical term if you know what we're talking about so early digital cameras yeah, what, what what is the technical yeah, term so for early, it <laughs> early digital cameras had a limit to the dynamic range they would handle all that means is like if you look at on a spectrum like even when you're looking at us right now things that are dark like shadows like this versus things that are bright like the wall or if i pulled one of these lights down it would, it would blow out right because the camera can't handle like your eye can handle it, but the camera can't render detail in dark areas. It, it has a range that it's limited to. Sorry, my mic's going over here. Um, I'm really into this. So uh, it, it was a way of taking, you could take three different exposures and then stack them together in the computer. Now, you have to exercise a little bit of restraint here because it has to look natural. And you can do that. But there, Which people did not do. They grew took a the trend. highest exposed and the lowest exposed. And, and they would compress it all into into like nothing that the, the camera could more than well handle, but it was too much that was compressed in there. And so like skin would look like metal sometimes. It was really off-putting, you know. It's disgusting. And, and, and it's less disgusting, but I, I kind of wonder too in the world of Instagram because there is definitely – a couple different styles of looks that are really popular on Instagram right now. And I have the feeling that right now, as cool as those are to get into, that's something that in 10 years, people are going to look back and go, oh God, what was I thinking with the... You know? I, I will say though, I feel like everything is more natural now than yes. what it was in the beginning. Because in the beginning... The cool thing, and I did it too, was you just take that black dot and you put it all the way up and you have that <laughs> faded look, right? Yeah, the fade, yep. The fade. The curved fade and, film look, yep. And that just ruined the pictures too because it's like, you're, this isn't a film picture. And because yeah. a lot of times what people don't understand is a lot of the stocks that people will use in film actually have very good punchy contrast mm -hmm. and saturation. Today they do, yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the fade thing. No, nope. the hipster, the lomography look. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I've, I've, we've all been there. It's, uh... <laughs> but you touched on photo essays, and I, I enjoy watching those and looking at those and looking at coffee table books. And um, there's definitely a time when I think the the peak of your photography career could be, you know, getting a photo essay in Time magazine, could be sure. doing photo essays in X, Y, and Z, and to really storytell along uh, powerful pictures. But as you know, you know, the times have changed and things have very much so gone digital. And so 
that has definitely shifted, I think. What do you think is the equivalent of the modern day photo essay for photographers and you know, journalists? I, I don't know because that our business has changed so much. Uh, and I think you and I, if anybody, we would have a sense of that because we're kind of at least try to be on the cutting edge of what's happening with YouTube and what's happening with, I hate the word social media sometimes, but but uh, in influencer media, I hate too. But you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's like this the fact that you and I, can have something to say and define it, and now we have an outlet for that. But it, it's you know back then when that the stories that that Gene Smith did were were running, those were in Life Magazine, and and that back then television uh, did not have the technology to keep up. Like when you look at a news cycle today, and you literally when when disaster strikes, like they can report within an hour usually with video and everything, and you had to have film back then and a camera, and so it just television and 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 there was a day even like my dad will tell me when he was a kid where they would go watch the movies and there would be newsreels at the theater um that's all gone uh life magazine's gone P people but my, sorry i had myself people because you didn't have that news cycle would look at the pages of life magazine look there were some others right so so many different forms of media yeah. have changed around print it media as well. was huge at that point uh, and then the problem now is it's it's the 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 immediacy of that news cycle, the fact it has to be so fast, mixed with the fact that I haven't heard the term in a while, but citizen journalism, where basically CNN or somebody will take journalism of people with their iPhones that want to submit, and there's yeah, and there's that. an app called Citizen yep. that does that. <laughs> does that yes. And then I remember um, I highly recommend for people who like documentary stuff to watch. Um, these series called 70s, 80s, 90s on oh, yeah, Netflix. Yeah, Netflix is so good. good. So they're, they're CNN originals, but there was a time where C, when CNN formed in the 80s, I think it was, or maybe the late 70s, um, there were no news networks. So the idea of a 24-7 news cycle was insane. Yeah, what are you going to put and on there for 24 hours a day? Exactly. So this idea of having worldly news for 24 hours was such a crazy concept. And when I was watching that, it was like, that's so natural. You know, yeah. that, that does seem yeah, so natural. It used natural. to be that there would be, uh, like ABC would do their news hour at night. And, and you had the famous uh, newscasters, the Walter Cronkites and the Dan Rathers and all that, you know. Dan Rather. Dan, yeah. Dan what, what, what's so funny about those series, too, is you just see the same news anchors just age on all oh, these. Yeah. And it's and funny. They do it forever. And it, it's funny how they've had the same people for the past 40 years. And I'm like, I wonder if. I, it's just interesting that they've stayed there for mm -hmm. so long and I'm like, okay, well once they get new blood in maybe in the next 10 years, are those people going to stay? Or I wonder if there's going to be like a I new turnover know. of, it's interesting to know. see it that. Yeah. yeah. The, the Dan rather is a lot of that has impacted the photography though, that we're talking mm -hmm. about too, because it's like, yeah, I guess that was the question. <laughs> but yeah, no, but in terms of, in terms of being able to tell a story and communicate through photography, I'll be really honest with you. I think the way you do that is through video now. It's what you and I are doing. Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, more engaging. Yeah, it's yeah. It, there. Really, isn't a platform right now for kind of storytelling through stills. I mean, I'm trying to think of photography platforms because you got Flickr, you've got Instagram, you've got Rest in Peace Flickr. Flickr. I guess. Um, yeah, Didn't I, Flickr I die? Aren't yeah, they it's killing been it resurrected off? again. And, oh, really? Yeah. I thought they were uh, killing Smug it off. Smugbug bottom recently. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So if you go to your old Flickr account, you can sign in without your Yahoo ID now. Wow. That big stuff, right? Wow. Yeah. And because I think Instagram <laughs> has turned into um, not f uh, photographic journalism stuff. It's oh, almost no, like the, no. the complete opposite. Of that. No. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it, Instagram, I have such a love hate with. And, and my favorite thing is when, when, when Instagram came out, uh, and that was still back in the days where you had new social platforms that would come out from time to time. And so you got to go reserve your name. And, stuff. and so I got my Instagram account and it got pretty popular pretty early. But what I loved about it is like I was able to, for a while just to keep my Instagram account kind of virgin in a way. It's like, you know what? I, I, I Nobody follows me here. So it's all friends and family. And, and I think that, that Instagram at its best, and this is for me what's really cool about it. So Instagram at its best is this. Um, it, it's my cousins in Minnesota that are being forced to communicate visually. And they're showing you something with one of their kids or something. And it's actually kind of cute. It's not a great photo. It's not, it may not be exposed right. Or, you know, the, there's no post. But it's like they're telling you something that's going on in their lives. And you can see that when they're forced to communicate visually that they're doing that. Um, and then, unfortunately, it gets to be kind of... Um, 
uh, sugar fest in terms of post production and and just putting up these amazing landscapes of all these places. Or then there's the fashion stuff, or the fashion, the the you know who I'm talking about. Oh, the yeah, yeah, look yeah. at me in the Model in Greece, yes, and, in the poses and the. Yeah, I remember going to the Grand Canyon last year and these two idiots sitting out on this ledge, and it was a week before two people were killed, falling oh, off of one yeah. up in yeah up in yeah. Um, Yellowstone. So I don't know. There's just it's bizarre, you know. Yeah, but, it, it kind of is this crazy crazy world but for some reason i was always instagram maybe fa- i haven't had a facebook in three years but facebook was genuinely a place where i used to share like with my friends what i wanted them to see but it got to a point where i just so didn't care at all that's that right I did, think you, it, did you delete I it i think it oh it's deleted it oh, was deleted three years ago see, I, gotta, I think i gotta take the plunge i think it's in a much for me it's almost healthier that social media is my job because i'm not trying to prove to my friend in ninth grade who didn't believe to me that i'm doing well i I could care less i could literally care less and so it's almost like healthier in a way that it is my job and i feel like i can turn it on and off watching my my mom and my uncle have a political fight in front of everyone and dude i charming you know facebook is Mm -hmm. dead to me great yeah (laughs) Last it's two so questions. Current. I know. It's just Facebook is awful. You can have a page there. Yeah, so I do I mean, paid I, for it. I do I do have like a Facebook page. I, I do have a public religiously facing, update on an um, hourly basis. That I don't think I've posted there in like six months or so. Oh, no, yeah. Sometimes brands will want to post so it there. Valuable. Yeah, I know, right. The brands still <sighs> see it though. Exactly, That's the funny part. Exactly. Um but I wanna kinda end on kind of like uh not a heavy question, but it's it's definitely deep. You're gonna have to okay. reach reach in. Reach in. It, it kind of has has to do with like the whole imposter syndrome thing. Um, but I'm actually gonna just read it because I I like typed it out. Cool. Um, so because like a lot of times when I'm teaching how I do things with making videos, you know, there's a lot of process and a lot of creative process videos. Um, sometimes I almost don't because I I look out and I see other things that are better than what I'm doing and so then I say oh who am I to teach this you know but obviously there's always going to be someone that's better than you right Um, and I enjoy making quality videos but at the end of the day I know my thing is that I can tell a story and so I I take pride in that Um, but whether it's a camera view or a docu-series type thing I I try to make it unique, but there's always that thing in the back of my brain. Not always, sometimes. That's like, oh, there's someone who can do this better, so maybe I just should, shouldn't should make this video or whatever. And so for you making your photography videos, is there ever self-doubt that you have to be a certain level of a photographer to talk about photography? I don't have that problem at all. I don't know which, no. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. Are you kidding? All My right, God, let's, everybody let's wrap deals with this that. up. <laughs> no, no, yep, no, no problem here. Uh, no, it's it's because what you're talking about is 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 we all have it, um, and it's taken me a long time to figure a lot of these things out because you know you meet creative people along the way, and then you make observations about the way certain people inspire you. And, you know, we all have our heroes we look up to, and 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 you realize that you're not alone in this. But but I don't remember who said this initially where I heard it, but, but it's like, we have this second voice in the back of our head that's telling us we can't do things and it can personify itself in different ways. And it's like, I guess it's tied in with our own worst critic, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, I, I, one, you should never do that, uh, because who cares if there's somebody who could do it better? Maybe they've done a different one. I mean, and that's okay, but maybe somebody's going to see the one that you did and it moves them somehow. Um, but it's really easy and we all do that. It's like, there's a voice in our head that says, you can't do it. You're not good enough. Oh, and I, let me, I'm too old. That's, that's my newest one. I, I'm being very open with you right now. Uh, by the way, I'm too old. I, I'm too, you know, there's people younger than me that uh, nobody wants to watch this old fart. Like, you know, do the, you know it's like, I, I, it's like, but at the same time you need to reverse that and say yeah. you have the most valuable, I, I think one of the most valuable, well, um, you. Uh, I don't know how you would say it, uh, perspectives because there's a lot of people that are kind of wanting a second chance at being creative in life. Um, cause I, you know, yeah. and so I think 
you are going to be able to relate to those 40 year olds, 50 year olds who want to pick up a camera and be inspired. So I think it's looking at maybe you see it as a weakness when it really is like a huge strength. Well, but my weakness is that that's what comes in my mind. And when I'm in my vulnerable periods where where I'm, I'm talking myself out of doing something, that's what comes in. Um, and, and I, I appreciate you saying that. And I hope that is the case. Um, and, and <laughs> Gary V says this too, um, you know, he and I are about the same age, um, that he's glad that he has the age experience of being in his forties of somebody who's not in their twenties because he says, I'll beat him every time. That kind of thing. Uh, and Gary's Gary and I love Gary to death, <laughs> Gary's but, Gary. but he's, he is, he's Gary, Gary and, and yeah. he, he's the same stuff over and over and he gets, ah, he starts yelling and cussing and, and, and it's fine. And I love all that stuff, but, but it's like, you know, you have to, any of these things, it's one thing to hear Gary V say, and it's another thing for you to figure out how that applies to you and how you understand that in your own life and your own creativity. And, and like you said earlier, you said just a second ago, um, if you want a second shot, there's no second shot. Just take your shot. If it's your third shot, your fourth shot, if you want to do it, like, you know, we're sitting here talking about playing guitar again because that's something that we both have in common that we used to do, we don't do now, and we should be doing that. Um, we got to find the time and create it. Like, you know, one thing I, my dad always told me is that, that you can do anything you want in life. Everything comes with a price. And that price is not money necessarily. It's time. It's dedication. It's, I think Casey Neistat did a video on this years ago, and he used that band Anvil as his example, uh, which was this metal band that never made it. But now they have a documentary, and they finally went on this world tour, but they got to the end. So, yeah, if you're willing to pay that price, and they wanted it bad, they they stuck it through to get it. Um so that's where it comes from, but but it's it's. You also started this by saying there's always somebody bigger, um, and and then the one thing that I realized, and I don't want to name names necessarily. Um, I I had a time, you know, we we come as about this stuff just in the YouTube world, where it's like somebody will will blow up and get really big, and you're like, wow, that's amazing, and 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 the great people. What it's beside the point everybody's different and it's frustrating because it's like, well, how come I can't do that? Maybe I'm not good comes into the play. Maybe I'm not interesting. Maybe there's, uh, there's a number of things that, that come into play. And I remember at one point it was, there was another friend of mine. I had one friend who blew up and I had another friend who was really having a hard time and like had done a lot of videos and had done this for a long time. And it's like, okay, I'm even Steven, right? You know, I'm in the middle. You always have to remember there's somebody bigger than you and there's also somebody smaller than you that you need to remember that and like be inspirational to them as well um, and note that there's a universe, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with all this. But you know what well, I'm saying? Yeah. It's, and, it, but yeah. it's, yeah, there's always somebody bigger and there's always somebody smaller and the thing is, it's like, it, there will always be and then my friend who's who's got the big channel, there's still people bigger than him and he wishes he could, you know, because your whole perspective shifts and, and I guess maybe we weren't directed enough because we didn't talk about this I mean, we just sat down and did this, this interview but I think that's one takeaway from like what we're saying today is that like, you know, how are you defining that success and what's important and I, maybe I'm taking away from this too because it's like, here, I don't want to do my artist series anymore yeah. um, but like, if you told me you never wanted to do creative spaces again, I would rather know that maybe it'll happen one day than you to say that because it's like, it's so right. valuable and it's right. like so awesome and, and right. you know, we have to do those things that are important, so love it i think that's how do we make that happen i I don't know you know what we keep yeah we keep chugging along but i think that's a great note to end on gary v sit here he did not he did not i i I had i go to him gary v is someone who you go to him right he's Um, he's yoda (laughs) exactly (laughs) um but thank you for so much for being on thank you for having me i think this was like so valuable it went by so quick boom yeah. If I'm going to be honest, like, how long have we I been still, talking? It's been an hour, 10 minutes, and I still oh. actually have a few questions. Um, but you'll just have to come back for round two, okay. I think. I can do it. So, so next time you're back in New York, we'll do a round two. Round two. Um, I, I think like that it. was so good. Check out Ted Forbes, Art of Photography on YouTube. Are you just your name on Instagram, Twitter? Ted yeah, Forbes? Yeah, just Ted Forbes on everything. Check him out, guys. He yeah. will be in the show notes below. Um, and yeah, let me know Thanks if you me, enjoy this, this awesome. podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah. And yeah, people can listen. You can listen anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, the website, thatcreative.life. Um, so leave a review. Say what's up to us on social media. And until next Monday, keep doing y'all's thing, guys. Feel like Stay Peachy is for the YouTube series. So I'm going to keep awkwardly ending these podcasts. Can I, can I, oh, you don't say Stay Peachy here. 
I don't. I don't really. I, I In the past, I've said, like, keep creating. Okay. Or... I promise we're wrapping this up. If you're still watching, you're going to get some real entertainment value here. Here we so go. So I, I have the same problem myself. Yeah. And when you look at the great orators. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Use that word. Be like, yes. Oh. You look at the, okay, so we're talking about Walter Cronkite and Dan Rather. Yeah. So you, you, I doubt you remember because this was before my time even. And in college, uh, I used to watch reruns of the Tom Snyder show. And Tom Snyder had a variety show. He, had, he was probably most famous for having Kiss in full makeup on his show. Yeah. And it was bizarre. This is in the 70s. He's got this weird hair. And he would smoke the whole show, right? And, uh, it, and uh, ha, 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 we'll be right back and laugh and bellowing smoke into the air. And Kiss, literally, like, I think it was the first breakup kind of started on this show. So it was legendary, right? And it was a variety show. He'd have different people. He'd have a musician one week. This is, I'm really extending your video here. Oh, I love it. He, he would have a musician one week. It would be an actor another week. It would be, you know, it was variety stuff. So sort of like what Charlie Rose did, but less formal. And uh, he used to have this sign-off. And it was, it was, thank you for watching this. And he said... This is so weird. Let me see if I can get it right. Sit back, have a color teeny, and watch the pictures fly through the air. We'll see you next time. What? Is that is that like wheels off? Insane. I mean. <laughs> oh my. Okay. So well, hey, you were the person who helped me come to the conclusion of rhymes with peachy. So what so is th my is what does be, well, what does my podcast outro need to be? You and I, we will decide this. But right now, okay. you're going to use Tom Snyder's. So it's going to be. All right. So when you think about too, I think Tom Snyder's probably of the age where he probably did black and white TV. So right. when they say fly, fire up the color teeny, they're playing on martini and color television. So sit back, fire up a color teeny, and watch the pictures fly through the air. This wow. is really, this is really, it's, wow. I gotta come up with a better one for you. I don't, I, oh my gosh. Yeah. But well, you gotta have something, right? I feel like we have to end this one with, you with me, the sign you want me off. to end it for you or do you want I, to do it? We're gonna borrow from Tom Snyder here. All right, all right. I think you're gonna have to do it because I can't remember that. And then, and then right. the next podcast we have, guys, we will have the official outro. I don't smoke, okay? so I can't emulate that part. Right, right. Uh, but, but oh, Mac, take us, take us away. Watching this guy smoke was was amazing too. I mean, a bad suit, big tie, and well, it's about all for our program this evening, folks. So, as always, sit back, fire up a color teeny, and watch the pictures fly through the air. Good night. Mm -hmm.